hello, hola, hola amigos, amigas, bienvenidos a Lima, welcome to Lima, Perú, welcome to my home and to another series dedicated to Peruvian history. Before we begin this event, I would like especially thank my Patreons who are supporting these events these um, investigations that I'm doing. So thank you so much to each one of them. Also, thank you so much to all of my friends who've been able to support my previous events with a donation on PayPal. This is highly, highly appreciated. And without you, I wouldn't be able to continue creating all of this. So muchas gracias, thanks a lot. And if you want to also have a special access to my content uh, after the end of the events, because they are not uh, going to be posted here on YouTube, they will remain uh, private and they will be uh, uploaded always in a video uh, gallery for my Patreons. So, um, well, there is information about how to become a Patreon also here in the description of this event. So, thanks a lot for coming to my amigos who are saying hi. Hola, Claire. Hola, hola. Thanks for joining. Hola, amiga. Hola, Natalie. Hola, hola, Arlene. Thanks for visiting me again. Uh, we have a, a very interesting topic ahead today and is about one of the most important festivities we have in the Peruvian calendar. Uh, Peru is a country that is mainly uh, Catholic. We Peruvians have raised mainly under the, the Catholic traditions and many Peruvians identify as Catholic, although they probably don't, don't have really that much closeness to most of the uh, Catholic, let's say, festivities, or they don't attend regularly to the church, but we will say generally we are Catholic. But Peruvians are not just Catholic. We are also a blend of different influences. And we are going to talk about the Incan uh, festivity, Inti Raimi. And also by understanding the Inti Raimi, the festivity of the sun that is celebrated every year on June. June 21st is the, the day when we celebrate this important festivity. Um, we will also be able to understand a bit more uh, of, of who Peruvians are and, and this unique culture uh, that we call the Peruvian culture, which is not just also a, a, a trace of the Peruvian identity. Uh, in Ecuador also, Inti Raimi is celebrated. Uh, in Bolivia, they have also their celebrations around uh, the, um, the, winter, the winter solstice. So we're going to learn about this today. But in particular, we're going to be focusing in the inaccuracies of the celebration of the Inti Raimi nowadays. And the reason why I'm doing this is because, well, to me, uh, it, it became such an interesting uh, theme um, to, to investigate about how accurate uh, the Inti Raimi, the big festivity of the sun that we celebrate every year as a commemoration of the one done in the Incan times, how accurate it is. Um, there are, of course, investigations done about this, so I'm going to present uh, a bit of, of all of the information I was able to recopulate. I am not a historian. I am an official tour guide. I've been guiding in Peru for over 16 years, and all of my years guiding have also given me the opportunity to have a better, a better insight, a, a most profound understanding of the culture of my own people. So, well, if you are ready to begin, uh, give me a thumbs up if you can. There is also a chat here uh, on YouTube that you can use if you have any question, if you want to uh, share like a comment. So here you have a chat. There is a little delay sometimes of some seconds uh, between the moment you send a message and the moment I receive it. So I'm just starting to see uh, a heart over there. <laughs> so. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. So um, let's begin with this exposition uh, with no further delay. Um, so let's talk about the inaccuracies in modern Inti Raimi. So 
Uh, by the way, for, for my friends who don't know what is the Inti Raimi, it's a very important uh, celebration um, that also has its origins in pre-Hispanic times. Uh, the first information we have about the Inti Raimi comes from the chroniclers, uh, from the uh, different uh, Spanish conquistadors who came to Peru during the time of the conquest of this territory. Um, not all of the conquistadors were illiterate, of course. It was necessary to bring uh, people who were uh, educated to document every single part of you know the the history uh, and the, and the presence and, and the situation in which the Spanish wedding were getting involved in because they didn't know you know what to what to expect of this land uh, and they ended up seeing a very complex society uh, the Incan society was very complex but we were not just Incas here in this territory because we had other different groups uh, you can call them tribes but basically they were very advanced cultures who the Spanish saw coexisting with the Incas. So before we begin also, I would like to give you, I always try to give a, a little quote from Peruvian thinkers, Peruvian writers. Um, Cesar Vallejo was a, a poet uh, and uh, well, I think this is this is also one of the most important uh, quotes uh, that came to me a long time ago, no? Saber más es ser más libre. To know more is to be freer. Uh, so um, my intention with all of these events is to open conversations about um, different themes uh, and not to, um, let's say, be uh, judgmental uh, with, with festivities or traditions of my country. I just want to discuss this uh, with you for you to understand better uh, these, uh, let's say, expressions of culture. So what is the Inti Raimi, no? the Festival of the Sun? The Inti Raimi was established by Inca Pachacutec in the decade of the 1430s. Uh, and it was celebrated every year during the winter solstice. Uh, this festivity, the mark, the beginning of the agricultural season in the Andes. So the importance of the Inti Raimi was that, well, for, for the people of, of that period of the history of Peru, the year began in that moment. So it was the beginning uh, of the uh, sort of like agricultural year uh, it started there, right? Although uh, the starting of the year uh, is pointed in December. Right, so it is uh, interesting to see that the calendar of the pre-Hispanic people was also very close to to our own calendar nowadays. Right, um, the Inti Raimi was the moment when the sun, because it was the most distant to us, uh, um, it needed to be sort of like a you know call back to come closer to us. It was the time also when we honor the sun and it was a moment for us uh, also to thank the sun for all the good things uh, we get from it uh, but it was a celebration that was conducted by the sovereign of of the community that live here of the Incan culture, uh, the Sapa Inca or the Inca King. So this ceremony was conducted by him and all the ceremonies were done by him because he was the son of the sun. So he had a connection with the sun. Being the beginning of the um, agricultural season also, every detail of this ceremony, uh, which was probably repeated precisely every year uh, um, was really not completely understood by the Spanish. So we have some traces of how this ceremony was. So we are going to today try to understand how that ceremony was in the Incan times using documents from the colonial period, right? Um, is this possible? Well, Yes, it can be possible, but there will be also empty holes, empty spaces, uh, 
things that will never be completely explained appropriately. So this event is going to be divided into parts. Uh, the traditional uh, documents and, and how this uh, celebration was done before, you know, the, the conquest, but with elements probably that were not very well understood by the uh, conquistadors. So we're going also to uh, try to find similarities between that ancient ceremony and the nowadays ceremony. The second part is going to be the nowadays ceremony, how it's done and how much uh, of the new ceremony, the modern ceremony um, is uh, like similar to the old one. So uh, this is the calendar of the uh, pre-Hispanic Peru. Um, we don't have any chroniclers from the pre-Hispanic times. Uh, we don't have any information made before the coming of the conquistadors. So that's why um, the Spanish who came here uh, were some of them more precise in describing things, some other not. Some other even, they incorporate elements uh, from their own traditions, their own beliefs, taking in consideration that many of these chronicles were priests. So they were fighting the devils, right? They were fighting the devils of the Incas. So in lots of their documents, we have a lot of, you know, pointing out the devils, the evil, you know, the, the, the terrible things in the way how they saw uh, them. But we have some chroniclers who were more sort of like in between. They were not judging. No? So this is the calendar of the year in pre-Hispanic times. Um, you can see also the names of each one of the months. There were very important celebrations. The year began according to the chroniclers and um, also, uh, especially one of the most important chronicles we have, Juan de Betanzos. He mentions that Pachacutec, uh, the ninth Inca, Pachacutec was the one who also reform a, a bit of the calendar. Oh, probably there were, uh, let's say, some similarities with the calendar before Pachacutec, but he was the biggest reformist. So he ordered the calendar oh, uh, starting in December oh, with a big celebration of the sun, the Easter of the sun. Oh, so that would be, of course, the, uh, the, the solstice of summer. And then later, you know, we can see how the different ceremonies, uh, uh, the different months are around the harvesting, around, for example, the worshiping of the dead. L give a look, for example, to the other extreme over here. We have November. November is the month when we pay call to the dead. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are moments in the year in which we know, for example, of uh, mummies being taken, unearthed, uh, taken out uh, to, to be uh, praised, uh, to be worshipped, right? So we have to now focus in the month that is connected with our celebration, uh, which is uh, the month dedicated to the Inti Raimi, so that would be uh, June, right? This this time, the Inti Raimi festivity. Okay, so uh, if you wish, also I can do other events in the future dedicated to uh, these festivities. What happened in each month according to the chronics, uh, the chroniclers of that ancient time? So just let me know if you would like to have or see an event like that one. Right. So the last Inti Raimi, when it was, when the last Inti Raimi happened? Well, the last Inti Raimi happened you know, during the time of the conquest. Oh, Arlene, I'm so happy you, you like the idea. So I will take notes on that too. Um, so the last Inti Raimi happened during the conquest uh, uh, of this territory. So uh, how is that possible? So we always have an idea uh, of the Spanish, you know, like uh, fighting, you know, the, the, the indigenous in a way that they were stripped from their culture and tradition right away after they came here. And the reality is not. The Spanish permitted the Incas to continue keeping many of their traditions uh, and even uh, uh, so much that they allowed uh, the Incas to still have royal figures, 
but we called these uh, pointed governors by the Spanish puppet Incas or puppet kings. So uh, we have also a series of um, very unhappy, you know, like governors who became uh, rulers, not because, well, it was maybe even the tradition, maybe in the regular circumstances they wouldn't be Incas, uh, but because the Spanish chosen them. And the Spanish use uh, systems that were not the same like the ones used in pre-Hispanic times. Also, for example, in Europe, uh, the, the first son, the firstborn, you know, legitimate son of the king will be, you know, like the next king. That was not the same case in the Incan times. So far we know now and we understand now the, the, this period of our history. So the last Inti Raimi happened in 1535. This is a time of conquest. The Spanish came in 1532 to begin with the expansion and the conquest. And it was conducted by an Inca, one of our puppet uh, kings, uh, a, and a Spanish uh, a conquistador pointed him to be an in in Inca, Manco Inca. No? So um, Manco Inca later fought for the resistance against the Spanish. Initially, he was uh, very close to the Spanish, but unfortunately for him, he realized the Spanish were not to be trusted. So later, uh, he turned against the, the Spanish, not before being mistreated terribly. Uh, and he, he lived all of the imaginable, you know, like atrocities that a monarch could have lived. Uh, uh, so I will be also creating an event special about the history of the Inca, Manco Inca, oh, and all of the successors, oh, which the story is very interesting. So we know that chroniclers, uh, Spanish chroniclers, attended to that last Inti Raimi. Mm -hmm. um, there were chronicles who were able to see, to witness ceremonies, uh, events, religious festivities, um, that we're able also to, to, to take notes about those. So we have information, first-hand information of those uh, events. Uh, um, and we also have chroniclers who hear from other people about those events. Uh, they, those informations also are very important for us. So I can here give you some names of some important chroniclers, uh, especially uh, um, I would like to talk about well Bartolomé de Segovia no he was one of the eyewitness uh, of the first years of the conquest uh, he arrived uh, uh, very early in the conquest uh, and um, he was able to be in the Inca uh, ceremony of the Inti Raimi uh, another important person Juan de Betanzos the first one in the list and um, he married also a indigenous woman so that's how also he was able to understand more profoundly the traditions of the locals um, and he married a, a high you know like a rank woman right uh, Inca Garcilaso de la Vega he's the first mixed blood uh, let's say um, men of, of our history he was the son of a very important a Spanish man and a princess, an Incan princess. And Felipe Guaman Poma de Ayala, eh, he also, a chronicler, made a lot of drawings about uh, different moments in the history of Peru, pre-Hispanic Peru and colonial Peru. So uh, thanks to them, we have this information. Uh, the first element that I found very, very interesting during this investigation for you uh, was that the chroniclers mentioned that mummies uh, of, uh, let's say, the important uh, people or the, the past, you know, the important people were taken out of their tombs and were put outside Cusco. Oh, um, we know nowadays still of, of a very, very much alive tradition of worshiping the dead. And uh, in the pre-Hispanic times, especially in the era of the Incas, mummies were reverenced in such a point that even the former kings 
uh, were never completely uh, unearthed, uh, uh, put in, in, in underground. They were kept in palaces and they were fed, uh, dressed, uh, clean, as if they were alive. Uh, by people of their families, of their panacas. Uh. So we had also many palaces in the Incan times where uh, these mummies still live as if they were alive, but they were dead. No, So um, this is a comparison between the map of Cusco at the time of the coming of the conquistadors and nowadays Cusco. Look at this very interesting shape of the city. It looks like a, a puma, wow. So this is also known as the Puma City. Uh, uh, Cusco uh, had a very, very particular shape and it's not the only case of a pre-Hispanic Incan city with a shape. Uh, uh, of course, this is still in debate. Some specialists don't believe these cities had a special shape, but there are people who believe that. And that is because um, the Incas believe in the principle of duality. So the duality in everything. And they believe this world where we live uh, was a reflection of the upper world, the world of the skies. In the skies, there are many dark constellations that they pointed as, for example, the llama, uh, the fox, etc. So they believe in replicating those dark constellations here uh, in, in the, the layout of the cities. This is one of the uh, theories. So when I'm talking about the mummies being taken out of their tombs, that means, uh, of course, um, in, literally showing them, expose them, but also they were taken out of Cusco. No, but Cusco was not as big as nowadays it is. So Cusco was a small. So probably they were taken to, to zones that are nowadays within the city, no? probably very close to the main uh, plaza. No? So you can imagine probably how this ceremony was. Now it has started uh, uh, all of this uh, movement of mo uh, mummies outside uh, their, uh, their resting places, their palaces, you know, um, it started the celebration itself, right? So another thing very interesting is the fact that uh, Incas awaited uh, uh, for the, the sun, uh, 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 the dawn of the sun, the raising of the sun, the first rays of lights of the sun to begin with this ceremony. It was a magical ceremony, a magical moment. And with the beginning of the, you know, the sun rays, the beginning of that, the Inca started to sing, you know, first of all, with a very low voice and little by little as the sun came to bright be brighter and brighter you know the voices the music continued louder and louder but remember that all of this ceremony has started with the inca as the first voice right and in the moment when the music continued going higher and higher uh, there were also sacrifices uh, of different kinds but everything started also with the drinking of the chicha Chicha is a drink uh, that is made from corn. It's an alcoholic drink. If you leave it for longer to sit, to rest, it can be very, very alcoholic. But chicha is from selected corn, uh, selected corns uh, was only consumed uh, in very special occasions. It's not that everyday people were drinking chicha or everyday they were um, sort of like uh, uh, getting a lot of alcohol. No, actually the common people, they had just some types of chicha that they could drink, but the highest quality of chicha from the best cones was only consumed by the Inca, right? So there was a toast with the sun also uh, made by the Inca. And uh, well, there was a, a series of sacrifices of animals uh, that uh, were done. So uh, chicha was offered to the Pachamama and also women, princesses, chosen women started to sing uh, and started to praise uh, the sun. 
right? So uh, these chosen women, uh, the chosen uh, girls of the sun, were taken originally from different corners of the country to serve uh, to the sun and to the moon. Uh, they were very young. They were probably very, very beautiful. And the Inca uh, married some of these princesses also. Uh, they were treated as sisters of the Inca. Uh, but not all of these women were the wives uh, of the Inca, the secondary wives of the Inca, because the Inca had one uh, wife that was sort of like the, the first wife, the Coya. Um, but these secondary wives, not all of them, you know, were married to the Inca. Some of them uh, were just put at the service of the Inca to pr produce the chicha, uh, to also um, produce the clothes of the Incas, and in some cases to be sacrificed, right? Um, so how long this festivity lasted, by the way? In the meantime, I would like to tell you that there is not consensus on how long this ceremony uh, took. Uh, some chroniclers mentioned that it was up to one week of celebrations. And it was really like repeating the same celebration over and over and over and over. So everything, the chantix started in the morning with the first rays of the sun and then ended uh, when the sun came down, you know. Uh, so the intention of doing this ceremony was to make the sun happy and to be given uh, from the sun, let's uh, say, the best crops because this is the moment when you plant a seed but you cannot do it without the um sort of like a, a, a the sun being on your side right the blessing of the sun some other chronicles mention that this ceremony lasted for one month one entire month uh, so but on the very last day of the ceremony uh as, as you know, there's no concept how long it, it took, but in the very last day of the ceremony, uh, the Inca started uh, with the plugging of the land. Uh, he, using tools made from gold, so far we know, uh, uh, well, started to open, you know, the, the soil, uh, and he put the first seeds, and that's the moment when officially the agricultural season began, right? By the way, something that I like to, to talk about in, in, in these occasions when I refer about the Inca and how he looked like and how he dressed like, um, we already know from previous events I've done that Number one, the Inca didn't use long hair. The Incas didn't have a long hair. I mean, not the common people. I'm referring to the Sapa Inca, to the Inca ruler. The Inca ruler had short hair, right? He was not shaved, but he had short hair. Uh, and when we think about the Inca in the moment of this splendor of ceremony, um, we think probably in an Inca dressed up in gold, and dressed up in, in silver. Well, my friends, um, not really. Um, for the Incas, gold and silver didn't have the same value, monetary value, uh, as for example, the Spanish uh, like gave to those metals. That's why they came also, they came to collect gold and silver. But the Incas consider indeed gold and silver to be special, but not of monetary value. Um, and they use in ceremonies like this one, elements that were also symbolic as gold and silver were for them. So uh, one of the uh, chronics, uh, chronicles mentions that the Inca dress, you know, some type of clothing made from the skin of bats, right? Uh, and here we have, there's a museum also in Cusco where there is an exhibit of these um, clothes as how we believe they were following the chroniclers, uh, the chronist. And we can see also this recreation here in a picture of how this leather of bats uh, look like, right? So imagine how many bats had to be sacrificed to make something like this, right? Um, so 
Also, another important thing that happened at the end of this ceremony uh, was a multitudinary mass sacrifice of women. Some chronicles pointed uh, in direction of human sacrifices done uh, in the moment uh, of the sort of like almost the end of the ceremony. And uh, we call these human sacrifices capacocha. And most of the times the capacochas were sacrifices of very, very young uh, girls. Boys could be also sacrificed. And in some cases, the sacrifices were conducted in mountains, in nearby mountains, in the Apus. Uh, but we know also of capacochas that happened in other locations. So uh, according to these chroniclers, probably there were human sacrifices also done uh, to please the sun god. No? There was abstinence in this period also for the common people. So we don't know if it was for one month or, or for just seven days or a few days. We know that abstinence in different ways also was important. For example, fasting, men didn't eat for a long period of time. They didn't consume chili or salt. Uh, um, they were also uh, drinking in consuming some type of uh, purification uh, drinks uh, and also it was forbidden to have any sexual intercourse during this period um, so it was a time for preparation uh, for uh, uh, this new season uh, uh, all of the um, chronicles mention of sacrifices of llamas um, many of them done, uh, but also seems that there is a moment in which uh, as an omen, as a way of, way of prediction, uh, llamas were sacrificed to see in their insides, for example, how the next year will be, right? Uh, so the Inti Rami was also a way for the people to know if the next year will be good in terms of agriculture. And not every year uh, was a good year, right? So if they got the prediction that the next year will be bad, what do you think they did, right? So they will be crying? <laughs> no, they were not, uh, you know, like a, just taking a bad, a bad omen. So, and that's probably why in some chronicles, uh, the celebrations are longer and others, the celebrations are described as shorter. And that is because uh, if the omen was bad, well, probably the ceremony will continue until the sun will give a positive omen for the year. So the idea was convincing or reverting uh, uh, this sort of like a, uh, uh, like bitterness the sun uh, could have against humans, uh, against us, because this was always a resulting of the behavior of us uh, uh, not behaving good in the eyes of the sun, right? So um, this is an idea of how the Inca uh, ceremony of the Inti Raimi was. Some of these events uh, were witnessed, as I said before, in first person by chronics, uh, chroniclers. Um, but there were no human sacrifices done in front of the chroniclers, of course. So meaning that some other pieces we are able to understand of the Inti Raimi were uh, recopilated uh, from uh, ancestral knowledge that the chroniclers were able to hear from the elderly of the community that they said, oh, this is what happened, this is how it used to be. So now the modern Inti Raimi, and we're going now to understand uh, what are the imprecisions, inaccuracies, uh, and of course, now you can understand why we cannot do it exactly as how it used to be done in the Incan times. All right. So uh, the modern Inti Raimi started to be celebrated in the year 1944, uh, of course, in its original place in Cusco. Um, the intention was bringing back uh, that self-esteem that was little by little being lost by the uh, more, you know, contemporary generations uh, um, 
towards you know the this this great society the the Inca society the pride of Cusco no so uh, Cusco was a very Catholic and is a very Catholic location but uh, this was sort of like a scream no to reclaim their Incan traditions no? uh, also we celebrate on the same day of the Inti Raimi uh, June is a is a month of celebrations uh, the uh, day of the campesino or the farmer day right so um, it was also a way to continue uh, reclaiming that uh, self-esteem around uh, being an agricultural nation right so this is a picture a uh, very old picture from uh, also one of the first Inti Raimis done in Cusco that is Sacsayhuaman uh, Sacsayhuaman is a fortress uh, located up high in the city oh uh, hi Gregory <laughs> see see Gregory this is a sort of like a, all of the preparation <laughs> so um so you can see here that we have the location uh, where nowadays we still do uh, this ceremony. Uh, but also notice some interesting elements. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of people within the central section of the uh, of the plaza, the main plaza of uh, Sacsayhuaman. Nowadays, of course, we cannot do that. We cannot get that into the plaza, right? Because we have more people coming, right? So uh, first inaccuracy, no? How many people participated of these ceremonies, right? Um, well, seems that the ceremony of Cusco was very, very private. Oh, Cusco was a very special city. It's not that everybody, you know, like came from, from distant locations to Cusco to be part of this ceremony because this ceremony, you know, was sort of like very elitist. This is one of the things that uh, we can find also in Chronicles. It was a ceremony that was conducted by the Incas and also the closest people of the Incas and the rest of the people, they took distance from, from this, right? Um, so this is, by the way, how nowadays, is this Ushnu. Ushnu is this sort of like element that is in the central section that is like a uh, like a truncated pyramid uh, where the ceremony uh, takes uh, now a uh, place. Uh, in the pre-Hispanic times, we had Ushnus everywhere in every central plaza because the plazas were not like the way how the Spanish saw them are uh, for, you know, like bringing water to home, like the plazas always have had a fountain. Uh, in that time, in that period, the plazas didn't have any fountain in the center, by the way. Um, the plazas had these ushnus, these locations where ceremonies were conducted. That was the use of the plazas. They were ceremonial plazas, okay? Um, so first of all, the ceremony took place in a very important location, so far we know originally. Uh, this site that is nowadays uh, a home of a church, a colonial church, the Dominicans church, in the Incan times, it also received many names, but the most famous is the Cori Cancha. Uh, the Cori Cancha, uh, the Temple of the Gold, the Temple of the Sun. Um, this is a place that we know is a site where this ceremony uh, started. So this is an accuracy, to be honest. Now, now we conduct the uh, ceremony first in this order in this location, right? Um, and the next location where we go with the uh, Inti Raimi is uh, the main plaza of Cusco. You can see a recreation also of the design of the main plaza back in the times of the Incas. Uh, and there is, of course, a central monument and Ushnu over there, right? And finally, uh, the ceremony continues in direction to Sacsayhuaman. Sacsayhuaman, uh, the, the temple, the place where we had a fortress, also a military fortress, and also uh, seems it was a, a religious center as well, right? So this is also a very old picture, uh, but more modern from the first one. Look at the numbers of people <laughs> in, in this site. Um, nowadays, in regular circumstances, 
before COVID, uh, it, it was, it is full, no? Now we are sort of like going back to that. So another thing important about the uh, inaccuracies uh, of the Inti Raimi nowadays, the clothes of the participants, the clothes of the participants, right? Um, well, during the passing of the time, we are trying to get also closer and closer and closer to how this ceremony used to be. And for a long time, by the way, uh, many of the actors who participated on the modern Inti Raimi were dressing up uh, with the traditional clothes of the farmers. Uh, but the farmer's clothes is not pre-Incan, is not Incan, is a Spanish. Uh, those uh, big dresses, you know, like uh, sort of with a lot of under layers, uh, the, the, the skirts with under layers for the women, you know, those um, uh, sort of like uh, uh, blouses, those are definitely uh, Spanish. They are not uh, from the period before uh, the uh, Spanish uh, here, right? So little by little, they have been, uh, the specialists, diving in the... Um, being more accurate no? in, in bringing the real fashion of the Incas into the display. Uh, this has been corrected also little by little. So here you can see a picture of, of those participants, those actors dressed up in the fashion of the uh, contemporary farmers. Mm -hmm. We have also another picture of the same element. You can see over here, right, women dressed up in the clothing of the farmers of nowadays, right? So this element is being corrected. But we have elements that are not, to be honest, like still like how they used to be in that times. So in the beginning, in the first part, I told you elements that are definitely not part of the Inti Rami nowadays. Sacrifices of animals, um, you know, this long ceremony also, if we wanted to do it accurate, we need it to be part in seven days, and that's not possible, of course. Uh, starting with the first rays of the sun, right, that is not uh, uh, what it, we do it nowadays, so it's inaccurate how we do it. We do a very express ceremony. And another thing is that, for example, nowadays, uh, the, the Inti Raimi is seen as a ceremony in which representatives from different parts of the Incan territory, you know, came to, like uh, from the four suyos, no? this was the Tawantin Suyo, the, the, let's say, the empire of the four parts, right? Um, but there are not enough uh, information saying that there were people dressed up in traditional clothes from different locations that were coming here to pay respects to the sun. Um, the Chronicles mentioned that this was a very intimate, very ceremony, local ceremony, and such thing didn't happen. So nowadays we have in the Inca uh, ceremony of the Inti Raimi, people dressed up like, for example, the people of the jungle, right? Uh, this is uh, from the Intis, the, the Amazon section. Uh, we have also the Koyas. We have from different locations, Koya Suyo, Inti Suyo, Chinchay Suyo, Anti Suyo. So the, the four Suyos are being represented. Uh, but as I said before, we are not very sure that something like that happened, that people were coming, representing their own you know, locations, coming to Cusco in that ceremony. Right? So these are some of the dresses that nowadays uh, are being used for representing all of these groups that were supposed to be uh, sort of like um, uh, coming in pilgrimages uh, to, to, to the uh, ceremony of the Inti Raimi. Right? But of course, it's, it's interesting seeing that little by little this ceremony is evolving. Right? Um, also, we have here the, the famous uh, flag oh, uh, of the, um, it is also called the flag of the Tawantinsuyo, the Wifala. Um, 
And we're going to discuss about the flag uh, of the Incas, if there was any flag. Also, we use a lot of that flag during the uh, Inti Raimi. Um, so the Inca, how the Inca look like, how he dress. Well, you know that we don't use uh, the, the clothes exactly close described by the chronicles. For example, if we want to be very precise, we needed to have a, a cape like made from uh, the skin of bats, right? <laughs> so that is certainly not possible uh, in, in this moment. And also another thing is uh, the gold, for example, the gold in the crown. Uh, we don't know of the Inca using any golden crown. Uh, the idea of golden crown is more Spanish uh, or European. Uh, instead, the Inca used something different. Uh, it used a, a, um, a sort of like a, a like a crown, we will say, but it was made from fabric and it was made also in red color. Red color was a very important color and there were also feathers coming out uh, from, from this uh, element. Uh, the creator of this uh, ceremony, by the way, was Pachacutec. Another inaccuracy about the ceremony is that uh, the ceremony uh, is a recreation of the Inti Raimi conducted by Pachacutec, the ninth Inca. But uh, Pachacutec, we know, and we know that all of the Incas didn't use long hair, right? So that is in the Chronicles. We know that they didn't use long hair. But the tradition says that the Inca uh, uh, used long hair, the Inca king, right? So once again, you know, like this actor, for example, he has long hair. Nowadays, all of the actors use long hair, right? So if we wanted to be very accurate, you know, this is a colonial representation of the Inca, long hair. But we know from the chronicles that they didn't use that length of hair. So we needed to use an actor uh, with short hair as, you know, the, the Inca uh, dress. So why nowadays we portray the Inca as a person with long hair? Uh, well, probably that is because uh, when the Spanish uh, met Atahualpa, Inca Atahualpa, uh, we know from the chronist of that time that Atahualpa had long hair, but he was probably the only exception of Inca uh, because Atahualpa lost one ear in one battle against his brother. And the ears were very important for the Incas because they used these uh, very big uh, earrings. Uh, uh, they were called, by the way, orejones, the nobility, because orejon means big ear person. So uh, the ears uh, were very important. They were, uh, or they show a status. So um, because Atahualpa didn't have one ear, one they, he couldn't wear one earring. So uh, in order to cover that not so aesthetic uh, part, um, he left his hair long right? Um, so if we are representing the accurate person, uh, if we are representing uh, Pachacutec, we should have an Inca actor with short hair and not long hair, right? So that's another inaccuracy. Um, the way how the crown or uh, the mascaipacha of the Inca is represented in gold uh, and golden feathers it is not accurate too, because we know, as I was mentioning before, that um, this borla, uh, this element that was more like fabric uh, uh, made, should have also real feathers on top, not of gold. And those feathers were also connected with the idea of the upper world, uh, the idea of also uh, the, the these birds that are able to live in the world where the sun god lives, no? the Hanan Pacha, the upper world, right? Um, so here we have another depiction, uh, this time from uh, the chronicle of uh, Guaman Poma de Ayala, Felipe Guaman Poma de Ayala, uh, in which we can see the Inca again with short hair. Also, oh, it's clear that uh, if we wanted to be more accurate representing the Inca, well, maybe uh, in the future, 
this should be taken in consideration, right? Uh, and the Koya, uh, the queen, we are almost coming to the end of the event, by the way, the Koya, um, which also in, in this year's celebration of uh, the Inti Raimi, took a very important role. Also, she was able to have a more important role, more central role in the ceremony, which is wonderful. But we know in reality, probably this role was not really as equal as the one of the Inca. And uh, she was not as reverent as the Inca, especially when we think about Pachacutec's time. So if we are representing a ceremony in which Pachacutec uh, is the person represented, there are some things that we should not uh, include. For example, here we see the Koya taken in a liter, right? And also Pachacutec is represented seated or standing on a liter, right? Uh, on this portable chair. There is a big chance that Pachacute was not carried in this way back in that time. Maybe yes, Huascar. Maybe yes, Atahualpa. But not Pachacute. Pachacute was more like a warrior. Oh, he was an expansionist. And during the time he became uh, the, the great you know, the emperor of this territory, um, he was not yet... Uh, like reverenced in that in that way. That is something, that idea of carrying the Incas in liters is something more like a, from, from the latest times of the Inca period. By the way, I remember reading also, this is very interesting information, that the Incas copied this fashion of being, you know, like carrying their leader on a liter from the Chimu, from the Chimu culture. And the Chimu culture developed in the north of the country. They did carry their leaders like this. So the Incas couldn't be inferior to the, to the people they conquered. So that's why they also started to use this, this form uh, of, for carrying uh, the leader in a chair, in a chair of golden uh, metallic elements or other. Right. Hola, Marilu. Thanks for coming. Uh, well, this is, uh, I would say, more an accuracy, by the way. We can see here uh, the uh, Kipu Kamayok, uh, a person with a Kipu, the, uh, the knotted system that uh, we are trying now to incorporate into this ceremony. Uh, but uh, curiosities, also I'm bringing some curiosities. Uh, the Incas, and now is we are very sure of this. The Incas had a, a writing system. They knew uh, to uh, save and store information using codes or using kipus, the knots, using also this element that you see here, these symbols uh, that you see here, they all were related with a writing system that the Incas uh, new, developed. So I just want to bring this also to, to, to here because I would love also eventually to tell you more about the writing system of the Inca uh, and we're going to develop one special event around it. So uh, we have here uh, these tocapus over here. This is a tocapu, this series of symbols made on, uh, on fabric. Uh, they are not painted, they were uh, woven. Uh, and each one of these symbols was related, some people believe with sort of like ideas, like for example, in the case of the Chinese ideograms, uh, but also, or words, right? But also some other people believe they were connected with sounds sounds, right? So probably the combination of those symbols produce a word. Also, oh, that is uh, the belief. And here we have the knotted system called the kipus. So, tocapus and kipus. Okay. Uh, we have to definitely dedicate one whole chapter to both of them. Uh, so, finally, about another inaccuracy the flags. Oh, the rainbow flag, the, the flag uh, of the Dovifala, no? So was there any flag in the Incan times? 
Uh, nowadays, many ex experts uh, say no. There was no flag in the Incan times. There was not a flag of the Tahuantinsuyo or a flag of the Incas. Europeans use flags. Uh, but here in Peru, we didn't understand it, that concept. We didn't use that concept. Uh, it is believed that instead of flags, there was some type of banners that represented the Inca, but not uh, the empire, not the Tahuantinsuyo. Um, so this idea of the rainbow flag also later became the Wifala, uh, and, and there are a lot of people who uh, support the Wifala as a, in a sense of unifying, you know, the indigenous communities as a symbol of unification, but uh, especially is believe that there was no flag in the Incan times. So if we stick to this uh, information, we should not be using uh, flags uh, because they didn't exist in that time. Okay, uh, we have a little bit more of this here. Uh, so modern flag, the modern flag was created in the uh, 70s, right? As an initiative of a local radio, uh, uh, Tawantinsuyo Radio. This flag nowadays is known as the flag of Cusco. Uh, and there is one more element that nowadays we have in the flag of Cusco, which is a uh, the sun, a representation of the sun, which is in reality a, a plague, a golden plague, very beautiful, 13 centimeters wide, so it's very tiny. It is called Placa de Echenique. Um, so, and the reason why that element, that symbol was added is because many people confuse, you know, these two flags. Uh, um, do you know the flag over here? Have you have you seen that flag? Do you know the difference between them? Who can tell me? By the way, <laughs> or oh, maybe you you have seen these flags before, but uh, you you are a little bit confused. <laughs> um, one of those flags is the flag of Cusco, and the other flag is the uh, pride flag, uh, the LGBTQ. Uh, flag. Uh, so the reason why we are using now a symbol of a, this other flag is because, well, many people were confused about uh, that that one. No, so this uh, festivity, the Inti Raimi, is a national patrimony since 2001. Um, but we are always evolving. There is a process of evolution, by the way, that is not ending. <laughs> uh, and, and that's also coming from the intention we have to make more accurate this ceremony. So my friends, um, thank you so much for coming. By the way, I hope you uh, found this event useful, interesting, uh, entertaining. Uh, the intention is entertain you, but also give you a chance to understand more Peruvian history. And well, this is this is not really judgmental. I don't want to be judgmental to the uh, this uh, festivity, no. I just want to show you, no, that there are true things about the ceremony and also inaccurate things that maybe at some point they can be somehow also corrected, but they are things that cannot. We cannot sacrifice animals. We cannot sacrifice women in the Inti Raimi in this time. No, So uh, there are things that definitely had to be put aside. We cannot have one month of celebration. <laughs> so, But this is how it used to be. Okay. So uh, to my Patreons, please, if you are not yet my Patreon, consider becoming my Patreon. Um, it, it's a very, very little fee per month. It's just one donation per month. Also, uh, you um, sort of like solicit uh, a subscription according to how much you, you can support and you can help me create content. Uh, my patrons have this, um, uh, let's say this poll to choose the next events, uh, the ones that will be more voted will come. Uh, so for sure, on August the 9th, we are going to have an event dedicated to the most haunted uh, hotel of Lima. So you're going to love it, but we still need more votes. So if you are my Patreon, please help me with this um, poll. And on the 29th, we will have 
a cooking class of lomo saltado in my house here on YouTube. So please come, uh, pass the boys, spread the news. Uh, it's, it's going to be lovely to have you. So let me now flip the camera on my direction so I can say bye to you. Muchas gracias, amigos. Thanks a lot for coming to my house today, for, for visiting me, for your love, for your support, and for, well, always um, keeping up that inter the interest for Peruvian history and culture. I am trying to create events that are engaging, but I cannot do it without your recommendations and, and your uh, comments. So if you have any idea of what could be a good theme for the next events, well, just comment it. You can do it right here, or you can do it uh, on private, or you can just post you know in in any of my social medias all of my information is in the description of this uh, event um so remember this event is not going to be after i finish the event it's not going to be posted on youtube it's going to a media library on patreon so you can see it over and over but if you support me also with a donation on paypal i'm going to send you the full link of this recording so you can see it also over and over as many times as you wish if you want to go into uh, research um so that's going to go private but for you. So muchas gracias. Thanks a lot. Have a lovely blessed day. It's been one hour. <laughs> so um, gracias and, and well, wish you the best in this day and all the coming days. Uh, so see you soon, amigos. Gracias. Bye. Gracias. Gracias. Thanks for coming. Gracias, Arlene, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. Marilu, Gregory also. Muchas gracias. Charity, uh, Harry, and all of my friends that were able to come. Claire, bye-bye. Ciao.